If you will, take your Bible and turn with me tonight to 1 Corinthians and 2 Timothy. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 2 Timothy chapter 1. And that's where we're going to start. We're going to be looking at a lot of different passages in God's Word tonight. We're studying on Sunday evenings the seasons of our life. We go through different seasons in life. And tonight we're looking at the season of doubt. And there are two verses here, two different books of the New Testament that really help us to navigate through this season of doubt. Paul wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to instruct us to deal with this subject. So let's stand together and look at these two verses. 1 Corinthians 2, 3. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Then turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. 2 Timothy 1 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Our Father, take these verses and open them to our hearts tonight and help us to apply them that we may know how to live through and learn from the season of doubt when it comes our way in life. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Please have a seat there. Paul, the apostle, gave advice to young Timothy when Timothy faced a season of doubt. And Paul was well qualified to give this advice about doubt because he had experienced it many times in his life. In fact, he described himself here as being weak, in fear, and trembling. And later he wrote to Timothy, And he told Timothy how he learned to face his own doubt. And he said, for God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. In other words, he's saying, Timothy, God wants to take you through the season of doubt and help you grow as you experience it. And he does that for you and me. And all of us are going to experience seasons of doubt Along the way. So, as we look tonight at Paul's advice to Timothy, let's look at some of the reasons that we experience doubt and some of the ways that we respond to it. I just want to mention to you two reasons, there are many more, but uh, two of these are probably two of the most primary reasons that we experience seasons of doubt. And the first one is fairly easy to identify and figure out, and that's failure. All of us have experienced failure in our life, and we're overwhelmed by doubt sometimes because of failure. For example, if we lose our job and we're out of work for several months, we may begin to wonder, will I ever get a job again? We begin to doubt. Or if we have a relationship that fails, maybe a divorce or breakup or another relationship, we begin to doubt and we think, what is wrong with me? Will I ever have a relationship again? Or if we yield to temptation, and particularly if it's a sin that easily besets us and we struggle with it and we yield to it over and over again, we begin to doubt our spiritual life. And we may even begin to doubt our salvation. So failure is one of the main reasons that we doubt. Secondly, and this one may surprise you, success is one of the main reasons that we doubt. Success. Many times we will face a season of doubt right after a tremendous success in our life. You know why? Because great success brings tremendous stress. And we feel like when we've experienced a tremendous success that we have to produce to continue to be successful and we doubt whether or not we can. So success brings about doubt in our life. 
I read about a Yale University psychologist who wrote that about a third of all Americans feel like they are flawed. And he said that a third of Americans are just trying to to fake it, to make it through. And here's something that he said that really surprised me until I thought about it. He said, the sharpest students, the best parents, the most effective employees were the ones who doubted the most. Now think about that. Why is that? It's because of this success syndrome. It's because once they are successful, they feel the pressure of keeping up with that success, and it creates doubt. Can I do it, they think. So those are two reasons that we doubt. Then let's look at the response to our doubt just a few minutes tonight, and we're going to move on to some things that Paul told Timothy to get through the the season of doubt when it comes our way. But when we face these seasons, there are four basic responses. The first one is listening to our doubts. Do you ever do that? Have you ever done that? Listen to your doubts? We've all done that. I mean, we just begin to doubt, and before you know it, we sit back and start agreeing with our doubts. And we begin to kick ourselves, and we begin to put ourselves down, and scold ourselves, and call ourselves names. And we would be better to stop calling ourselves names and start calling on the name of God. Amen? And God will help us navigate through these seasons of doubt. And then ignoring our doubts is one way that people deal with doubt. Pretending that doubt is not real, that it's not really there. And if listening to doubt makes doubt big, then ignoring our doubts makes them even bigger. We ought not ignore our doubts. Thomas did that. He tried that. He wanted to do that. He wanted to ignore his doubts about the risen Jesus. And when Jesus returned a week later, he wouldn't let him do it. And you remember the story. Jesus said, look at my hands. Look at my side. This is what your doubts are about. He was saying to Thomas, don't ignore it. He was teaching Thomas that God can get us through seasons of doubt. And we can come out the other side and be a lot stronger for it. Then there's a third response. And that is to lie about our doubts. Lying about our doubts. Some people do that. They say, I can do anything. I can't fail, they say. Now listen, you can do a lot of things but you cannot do anything. Only God can do anything. Amen? There is a lot that we can do, but only God can do anything, and only God can do everything. And then here's a fourth response, and it's the best response, and that's be honest about doubt. When you have a doubt, just be honest about it. Be honest with God. He knows anyway. Tell God, about your doubts, and then read the truth in God's Word and act on the truth. And that's a great thing about the Bible. It doesn't sugarcoat anything. It just tells us the truth about ourselves. Now, let's move on tonight by looking at what Paul said here about the remedy to doubt. We're going to look at some truths that Paul shared with Timothy and some of the other New Testament churches that he used in his own life to overcome his own doubt. But I want to say this. Now look, look at me. I want you to get this. It's not enough to know the truth. Did you hear that? It's not enough to know the truth. You have to apply the truth. You take what you know and you apply it if you want to overcome your doubt. If you're hearing me, say amen. All right, let's look at the remedy to doubt. How do we live through a, a season of doubt? Well, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And look at verse 12. And Paul is speaking now to Timothy, young Timothy, who's going through a season of doubt in his life. And I want you to see what Paul said. 1 Timothy 4 verse 12. He said, let no one despise your youth. 
but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Timothy, you see, was doubting his influence for Christ because he was young. And Paul said, listen, don't you let anyone look down on you because you're young. He said, be a godly example. And the remedy to doubt is exactly that. It begins by being a godly example. There, there's always a because. There's always a reason we think that God can't use us. Timothy said, I'm too young. That was his because. Moses said, I can't talk. That was his because. Jeremiah said, because they won't listen. Sarah said, because I'm too old. There's always a because. There's always a reason that we can come up with that God can't use us. But Paul said, when you doubt like that, don't let people look down on you because you're young. He said, be a godly example. And the truth is, we struggle the most with ourselves. Can I get an amen? I mean, we really do. We tell ourselves how God can't use us because, and you can fill in the blank in your own life, because of what? The truth is, God can use us. And the truth is, God is, God wants to use us, and we are important to God. One of the reasons that we face doubt in our life is because we misunderstand what humility really is. Humility is not denying the importance of our influence for Christ in this world. Humility is simply seeing God as most important and people as more important than we are, but every one of us is still important in the sight of God. And God can use us when we act upon His truth. So we should be a, a godly example. Somebody's watching you. It may be your children. It may be your neighbor. It may be somebody you're working with or somebody you go to school with. But somebody is watching you and you, whether you realize it or not, are influencing somebody's life. Paul is telling Timothy to remember to be an example in his words, in the way he talks, in his life, in the way he acts, in his love, in his faith, in the way he trusts God. Do you know, when people watch us go through a season of doubt, they will trust God more when they see our faith in a season of doubt. It speaks volume to people, to, to people to see that. So Paul said, Timothy, listen, be a godly example. And he further defines this principle. Jot down 1 Corinthians 11, 1. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he said, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now that's simple. He's saying if you want to be an example to somebody, follow the best example that you have, and the best example to follow is Jesus. Jesus is the best example. So Paul says to Timothy, when you doubt, be a godly example. Then here's the second thing. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Maybe we ought to have an old-timey sword drill tonight and see who can find it first. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. And look at this passage of Scripture. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. What's Paul saying? When you go through a season of doubt, be a godly example. When you go through a season of doubt, depend upon God. Depend upon God. You know, the truth is we can meet some of our own needs, but we cannot meet all of our own needs and we must depend upon God. That's a good place to say amen. We must depend upon Him. Listen, one of the main reasons God allows a season of doubt to come into my life and to come into your life is to remind us that we have to depend upon Him. 
That's one of the reasons he does that. In fact, we have a cycle that goes on in our life kind of like this. We depend on God with everything we have, and we really try to follow Him. And we go along good for a while until all of a sudden we have a sense of confidence that we're doing great in our spiritual life. And so we think, well, God, I'll take a little bit of the load off of you. And so we try to depend upon God less and start depending upon self more. And the more we depend on self, the worse it gets and the worse it's going to get. And eventually what happens? We fall flat on our face. We're reminded that we must depend upon God. And then we start to depend upon God and things get better again until we start to depend on self, and then we go right back through that cycle again and again and again, another season of doubt. So Paul teaches us, when we go through the season of doubt, we need to stop and check up and make sure that we're depending upon God. All right? Paul said, be a godly example, depend upon God. And then number three, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. And then in 1 Timothy 4.14, he said, Do not neglect the gift. That is in you. What's he saying here? When you're in a season of doubt, it always helps to remember your value to God. Remember your value to God. God has put us on this earth for a purpose. His purpose is to have a relationship with us. And God created us and gifted us to serve Him. So Paul is saying, instead of spending our time doubting, just stir those gifts up inside of you that God has given you because you're one of a kind. There's nobody else like you with the exact combination of gifts and personality and experience. There was a story I read about a lady who bought some earrings from Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. She had a garage sale, a little garage sale. And this particular lady bought a pair of her earrings, $12,650 for a pair of earrings. She needed to have her head examined, amen? $12,650. You know why she bought them? Here's what she said. I get to be a princess every time I put them on. That's what she said. I get to be a princess every time I put them on. Why did she feel that way? Now, why did she pay so much? It was because those earrings were one of a kind. There was nothing else like them in the world. Friend, listen. God says you are one of a kind. You really are. You are a child of the King. Put on the gift of God. Stir up His gifts in you. Because there's nobody else exactly like you. God made you to be you to bring glory to Him by using your gifts. And when you're in a season of doubt, remember your value to God. When we doubt, two great temptations come into our lives concerning God's gifts. There is the temptation to be an imitator. And there is the temptation to be a spectator. We're tempted during a a season of doubt to be an imitator because we look around And we see other people and we think, maybe if I was more like that person, maybe if I could be just more like them, I would be better off. So we try to imitate them and it does not work. I've seen young pastors do that for years. They see a famous preacher and they try to be an imitator of that preacher. But God has called them to be who they are. I heard Jerry Vines at First Jacksonville one time tell a story about going home on a Sunday night after preaching, and he asked his wife to fix him an onion sandwich. And she looked at him, kind of like some of you were looking at me when I said that, and she said, "An, an onion sandwich? Why do you want an onion sandwich? He said, well, the greatest preacher that ever lived was 
Dr. R.G. Lee. And he said every Sunday night when he came home, he would eat an onion sandwich. She said, now Jerry, do you believe that eating an onion sandwich is going to make you preach like R.G. Lee? He said, well, no, but if I can't preach like him, at least I can smell like him. (laughs) Be who God has gifted you to be. And you know, a lot of churches try to imitate other churches. Now listen, we can learn from other churches, but we don't need to imitate any other church. We ought to be the church that God has called us to be. Amen? I mean, when you try to imitate somebody else's gifts, you look silly. You know why? Because God says you are one of a kind. You are valuable to God. And then don't be a spectator. There's a tremendous temptation to be a spectator when we face doubt. We start to feel like somebody else could do a better job. And so what do we do? We withdraw and sit in the stands and we say, I'll cheer. I'll watch the game. I've, I've had my time on the field. But God wants you in the game. God's got a place for you that nobody else can feel. God wants you not to be a spectator or an imitator. God wants you to do what you're best at and what He's gifted you to do. And when we use our gifts, the Bible says we bring glory and honor to God. And there's nothing, nothing better than that. And then he has a fourth thing here that he shares. He says when we go through a season of doubt, that we need to make a decision to grow. Make a decision to grow. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's God's desire for every one of us. Doubt can drive us to depression or it can challenge us to grow. And God wants it to challenge us to grow. If you've been a Christian for 10 minutes and you're growing, you are miles ahead of the person who's been a Christian for 10 years and think they know everything and is not growing at all. What pleases God is not how much we've achieved, but whether we're growing right now in our life. So make a decision to grow. And where does it start? Well, it takes hard work. It takes discipline. 1 Timothy 4.15 says, Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Let me me tell you this. You're not going to grow very much if all you do is come to worship for an hour a week. Are you hearing me? Can you say amen? I mean, I'm just being honest with you. In fact, can I just be straight up with you? Can I? I'm I'm going to anyway, so... uh, I just want to be candid with you. Every person in this room, now listen to me. I'm saying this in love, but it's true. Every person in this room needs to be part of a small group. You need to be in Sunday school, or you need to be in a life group. Every Christian needs to be in a small group where you can grow under the teaching of the Word of God with your fellow Christians in an intimate small group setting. And have you discovered that the things that help you most, sometimes you don't want to do? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, sometimes the things that God says will help us the most, we don't want to do. And that's why over half of our church membership is not even enrolled in a small group class in any way. So we have to cultivate these things. Let me be honest. You're not going to believe I'm going to say this. But we don't want to go to church every Sunday. I mean, let's, let's be honest. I heard about a man that woke up one Sunday and it was raining. And he told his wife that he didn't want to go to church that day that he was going to sleep in. She said, honey, you've got to go. You're the pastor. <laughs> we all have days like that. But we have to discipline ourselves if we really want to grow. Paul is teaching us to make a decision to grow. And that's what a church family is all about. It's a place where we can grow together. 
And when that begins to happen, we begin to allow God to take us through the season of doubt. And the result is Ephesians 3.20. Listen to this. With God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we can ask or imagine. Did you hear that? Through His power working in us. You see, a Moses who thought he couldn't talk stood before Pharaoh, the greatest leader of his day, and said, let my people go. And Pharaoh did that because the power of God was at work in his life. Or Moses did that. You see Jeremiah saying, I'm too young. They're never going to listen to me. And he became the great prophet that spoke for God. The people didn't listen. He was right about that. But we read his words today. And we still listen to what he said so long ago because of God's power. Sarah said, I'm too old to have a child in my old age. But she did because God is powerful. And we see Timothy becoming the pastor of the church at Ephesus. A young man pastoring one of the greatest churches in the early days of the history of the church. Listen. God wants to take our season of doubt and turn it into a season of significance. And He'll do that if we will be a godly example and depend upon Him and remember our value to Him and make a decision to grow. And God's people said, Amen. Let's stand together. Lord, help us to take your word tonight and apply your truth to our hearts and make these seasons of doubt that we all experience a time of growth in our life and a time of power when you can use us to glorify your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our invitation tonight is simple. If you do not know Jesus as your Savior, we invite you to step out from where you're standing and come forward tonight to receive Christ as Savior of your life. And if you would like to unite with this church, there's not a better time than tonight. Everybody in here, if you get saved, everybody in here is going to rejoice. Amen, church? Not only that, if you get saved tonight, the angels in heaven are going to rejoice. And if you join this church tonight, all of us will rejoice with you. So if that's the desire of your heart, you come as we sing.